All right. We are back. PJ Con, the last day. And uh, you can tell it's the last day because in uh, traditional convention fashion, I have yet to shower despite it being noon. <laughs> but uh, so joining us today uh, is actually uh, one of the first panelists to sign up for PJ Con. Uh, one of the first people to suggest even having like uh, outside panels. Uh, Bishop Clark. Hello. Oh, we're... As expected, we have lost sound. Give me a second, Bishop. Ah, I got it. That was me. My oh. computer being super slow. Oh, so okay. I hit the mute button, the unmute button, but there was a delay. <laughs> P- oh, that's about right. PJ Con 2021. This is what we're doing. <laughs> It'll be. Okay. So, hi. I have been given the, the brief introduction already. But first, I want to go ahead and pull up the handy dandy little PowerPoint that I made for today. We're going to go ahead and get started. Now. Well, be- before you jump into that, then, Bishop, let me ask you a couple questions real quick. So of um, for those of you that uh, have unfortunately never met Bishop Clark, let me uh, enlighten you. Uh, Bishop has been a friend of mine for quite some time uh, at God. I mean, we're, we're approached. It's like eight, nine years, something like that. It, it's been many. Yeah. Who's this guy? There we go. Okay. So, so Bishop, I just, I guess I want to ask real quick, why'd you get into libraries? Oh my God. Okay. So I got into libraries primarily because I grew up having to move around a lot. Like, I think when I last counted and like I wasn't finished with high school yet, it was like nine schools, 13 houses, like across like three states. So I got used to kind of moving around from place to place and not really being able to have anything like consistent. And libraries were one of the few things that were just kind of always there no matter what I did. And like, I was a giant reader as a kid. And so like, I spent a lot of my time either reading things that I had gotten from the library or begging my mom to get me to the library to get more things to read. Because like, back in the day, I did have a Game Boy and I enjoyed it very much. But when you're in the car at night, trying to actually like play the darn thing is kind of a giant pain in the butt. So like being able to have something to kind of like more physical and tangible, like turned out to be really helpful. And so years later, much further down the line, um, I was making my way through undergrad and I was just very stumped about what to do for like life. And I kept finding myself back in my campus library because like there was like a bunch of like meeting rooms and things that could be used. Like I could look through the stacks and just kind of see, okay, what on earth is even in this place's like collection? And so at that point, it just occurred to me, why don't I actually try to work here? And (laughs) it took me a while. Because, like, I had that thought process in, like, when I was 19, I think. But it didn't really stick around because I was in the middle of a lot of mental health uh, obstacles at that time. And so once I finally had a bit more freedom and a bit more uh, of myself back, I just threw my hat in the ring to see if I could get a job as a library assistant. And now I work for Chesterfield County Public Library. So that's like the path that led me to where I am currently. What I'm trying to do now is find my way into a master's program for library science, because then I can start taking on the big boy library jobs. And that I think will be where I land once I figure all of that out. So when you, I guess this will lead into your PowerPoint now, then uh, Mm -hmm. when you even suggested this to me, I remember being like, okay, why, why do you, uh, I, what what exactly are we going to talk about with libraries? Because like most people, I just think of like libraries as books and Wi-Fi because that's what I would use it for when uh, when I was a kid. Uh, so 
uh, apparently I am an ignorant fool. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So here's the thing I do want to make very clear. People, like I wouldn't classify anybody who doesn't know the full extent of what libraries do as like an ignorant fool for the simple reason that I work in one and I'm still every other like few weeks or so learning about some niche thing that like my particular system does that like what what do you mean we do that so what you're saying is they need to hire you as the pr agent then okay so libraries have historically had a bit of a pr problem specifically when it comes to publicizing their services that aren't already in the common fabric like a lot of people already understand, hey, if you want to like check out a book or a movie or like get to a computer or Wi-Fi, like, yeah, go to the library. Those things have been well established. What hasn't necessarily been well established is all the other crap. And so that's what we're here for. Right. And so I think that one of my favorite librarians is Shamichael Holman. He's a black man who works at, well, not works. He is the branch manager for one of the branches that called like back in like the civil rights era, called the police on a group of black patrons because the segregation laws were still in effect. And like 50 plus years later, now he's in charge of it, you know? And so one of the, his philosophies is that like libraries are best thought of as bridges. And like, the more I thought about it, the more it made sense because like, there's a lot of stuff that it can connect you to. So like, I guess the one point that I am primarily here to make is that you do not, I'm, I'm gonna emphasize this, you do not know what your library has access to until you check. Like, I will shout that from the rooftops because like, there are some times where you just look at something and you're like, this is very helpful, but why is that there? And the primary reason is because the good library systems are responsive to what their patrons and their communities require, which means that every library system by design is going to be a little bit different because the communities that each one is in are all a little bit different. Some are a lot of bit different, but like, you don't know that until you get there. And so I do have a couple of, uh, of examples I want to try and run through. So let me see if I can pull that up within the Zoom or if I'll have to like just stop and share the whole screen. Okay, what can we all see? What can you see? Is it still the PowerPoint? Let me see. Okay, good. So I think we are here at the special collections page for the branch, the, the system that I work at, which is Chesterfield County Public. And so I want to Sorry. point out- Hey Barry. Bishop, we, we yeah. can still only see my examples. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Let me modify new share screen internet, yes. Let me just do the whole screen. That's probably the most expedient. There we go. All right. Excellent. Okay. So um, where we are right now is my systems like research, not, not research, but like their, um, their homepage. And one of the places that you are going to want to check out when you do this is most places will have tabs right at the top of the screen. And so where we are is use the library. And so you'll see a lot of like the everyday things that you'll need to know about. So book and material selection, which gets you access to the catalog. Like you can even in a lot of places make suggestions about what the library should purchase. Now we can't do it with my system because we're currently in the middle of transitioning from one database to the other. But once that's finished, there is a form that you can pull up to basically write a brief uh, letter or a description of what you would like to see your library purchase and like what's 
like why you think it would be a good addition to the collection. And like a lot of those suggestions do wind up getting purchased, at least in the places that I've been. So definitely worth giving that a shot. Um, but I'm primarily here because I want to show y'all something called our special collections. So special collections is basically a catch all for all of like the, the unusual stuff that you may not find on the main floor of a library. And so you have a bunch of cool stuff. Like you've got what I have been checking out a lot lately as we start to roll into fall which are the I Love Virginia State Park backpacks, which are backpacks that you can go and pick up from the library that get you free admission to quite literally all of the Virginia State Parks. Whoa, whoa, uh, hold on. This is like a physical backpack that you mm -hmm. pick up? Yep. Like you walk into the library and you're like, hey, I'd like to check out the Virginia State Park bag. And they hand you a bag that has passes for every, that'll get you into every Virginia State Park that you can get your hands on. What the heck? Who would think that that's there, right? <laughs> right, like, no. <laughs> that's... Like, imagine just being a random person walking in and saying, hey, Man, I just want to do something this weekend. Like I have the Saturday and Sunday off, but I'm just bored. And like, I'm behind the desk and I'm just like, do you like to hike? And I just plop a backpack in front of you. <laughs> and I'm like, want to go to the park for free? Like, I can just do that. But this is kind of an extension of the point that I made before, which is you do not know what your library has until you check. <laughs> And so that's just one of the little, little quirks. Another good one is a similar thing um, with museum pass bags. So like if you wanted, for example, to get like a pass to visit the Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden, which is like in our area, go to the library and place it on hold or pick it up and like, Congratulations, you have now gotten free access to a botanical garden. Have fun. Like So I'm guessing that the library has uh like um a limited supply of these things usually. Absolutely. Because like there is a certain level of because like these are agreements that have to be worked out with each particular um, place. And so some places might be more liberal, like, hey, yeah, you can have like 10 of these out in a given time. Other places might be like, mm, let's keep that down to like two. And so it is a pretty individual process, but it's still pretty darn cool because they're still classified as items in our system, which means you can place holds on them just like you could a book, which means that like the next time it's returned and available, you get a handy dandy little email that says, hey, that Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden Pass is up for grabs. It has been set aside for you. Come get it in the next five days. <laughs> so, so you can't see my face right now, but I've been making a lot of like surprised, get the fuck out of town expressions here. So, yeah, no, that's definitely the uh, the intent there. And so the other thing I wanted to uh, get to, I don't know if it'll let me. Yes, perfect. Okay. So a very common use of library space is a lot of them will have uh, what they call meeting spaces or learning pods, or there's a bunch of different names. But basically, a lot of libraries in this day and age have like like little offices and tables and chairs and things that like you can just reserve. And so that was a really interesting thing that we offered during the pandemic, because even while the library was like physically closed for like common everyday use, if you booked it in advance, you could still get access to some of our, um, like our individual like study rooms and things. And so one of the people who used to show up to the branch I worked at a lot was a law student who was preparing for the bar and needed that space to be able to study by themselves, but like couldn't really get it because again, 
middle of the pandemic, most other places weren't necessarily open to the public. But because we had those specific spaces that we could control access and airflow to and like clean in between uses, and because they were being reserved in advance, we were able to safely offer that um, that home away from home, even in the middle of the worst of times. And, and so... And I, I asked you uh, before we went live, like, hey, Bishop, <laughs> why are you wearing a mask? Yeah. And the reason I'm wearing a mask is because I am doing this panel from a meeting space in a local library that I reserved. I went on the website, I logged in, and I said, hey, I need to request a space for this time and for this long. And I got approved. And so I'm here. And so briefly, for free, I have like my own table, a couple of chairs, got my water bottle, even got like a window if I need to open that at some point. Like I have a whiteboard, got like a marker, got an eraser. Like there are people who pay hundreds of dollars in office space rent for a thing that like you can just get with a library card. Like okay <laughs> yeah i actually i remember uh this one of the few things i i have done with uh the local library in charlottesville mm -hmm. is that like uh democratic socialist meetings would take place there yes and a lot of the reason for that is because it's one of the few public places where you can get access to meeting and gathering space without a financial cost because we live in a hyper capitalist like nightmare there are so many places in the world that you cannot physically be without some sort of financial input but like libraries are one of the rare spaces where that's just not the case because they are specifically places and services that are designed for public use and that is their primary purpose which is not the case for most other things in this, this nightmare of of 2021 Okay, so I think I, I've, I've made my point with like my particular branch, but there are a couple of other really interesting uh, services that are being offered elsewhere. And so let me see if I can pull that up because I know I'm screwing my whole screen, but yeah, there we go. Okay, so one of my friends <clears throat> lives in a pretty low key area in Pennsylvania that's like a little bit outside of, um, I think it's Philly. And so there were a couple of books that she was looking for. And of course, me being who I am, I'm like, hey, I know that you're like a very busy person, but have you had time to get a card with your local branch? And she was like, you know, that's a fair point. Like, I just haven't had the chance. So I went poking around because of, who, again, who I am as a person. Whenever I, like, look around at, like, other branches and things at places where my friends are, it's always interesting to see what they have that, like, my branch, that my system may not. So this is the library that was closest to, um, to her at the time. But when I started poking around, I found a few things. So the one thing I would always recommend that you do when you're trying to figure out what your library has access to, actually take the time to look through these tabs because there are so many things. Like for example, Lower Marion has a similar program to like the one we have that will get you access to like parks and museums and things. You can do like a similar thing in this area checked out for free, free of charge, first come, first serve for three days. Like, that's pretty cool. But the thing that kind of stunned me the most was looking through the online resources, because at the time that I was like poking around for this for her, um, she was still in a place where like she had to like 
not like the library wasn't physically open at the time. So that meant that a lot of what she would be able to get access to was the e-library or the digital resources. And so of course you have the catalog search, which you can figure out, hey, do you have that latest like uh, Danielle Steele novel that popped up? But you also have things like access to eBooks, which is something that I actually take advantage of a lot because the really cool thing about being a like a patron at your public library having your card is that it's not like a tiered subscription service or anything like it's not like hey you're like a a pre a free user upgrade to premium no if you have a card everything that's available to the public is available to you god that's so refreshing but anywho um, one of the common uses of that, like digitally, is overdrive, which is also in some cases known what some of you might recognize as Libby. And so you can like reserve access to ebooks, like audiobooks and magazines and videos and like a bunch of um of digital media resources. Same with canopy, same with hoopla, like there is so much. Like, even if you're the kind of person who's just like, man. I want to know like what the 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 latest model of like headphones or whatever are you like consumer reports those are here all you need is like to be a member of the town that this area is in a library card and you could just see what's hot on the market this year in like various uh like devices and equipment so but, it's, it's like magazine subscriptions then mm-hmm. so like if there are now, again, this is a thing that tends to be system specific, but like it's not uncommon for a library system to maintain like uh, system level memberships in places like the Washington Post, like the New York Times, like, you know, all of those little uh, websites that have good information, but frequently lock it behind paywalls. Because yeah, we society. I, I have been so frustrated about that. And you're telling me that like. That some libraries, my if my local library has access to that, I can I can then just I don't have to worry about the pay paywall. Yep, that's that, how I get access to a lot of this stuff. That's so important to know. Like that should be screamed from the rooftops. Yes, and so like this is the sort of thing that I think about when like. I'm remembering that one of the key ideas of libraries is the idea that they are places that connect you to information, free and open access. And so to that end, a lot of them will maintain um, like memberships and subscriptions, not just to newspapers that might otherwise be financially um, restricted, but also it gives us access to things like fucking, where is it? Online resources is what we're looking for. Yeah. So like you can find like access to certain databases with like, like scientific, like humanities, like papers and research projects and things of that nature, just by virtue of having a library card. Like a lot of students that I run into, specifically college students, will rightfully lament that once they graduate from undergrad, it, they lose access to a lot of like those, um, those academic databases that they use to do a lot of like their research and studying. But a lot of the time that can be circumvented if the area you're in has a library that subscribes to like uh, some of the more like widespread um, like academic databases. But in the case of me looking around with just kind of like seeing things that would be helpful to the person I was helping. So she really likes having the opportunity to work on her own car, but a lot of the classes that she was going to to learn that sort of thing got shut down in accordance with the pandemic. And what are the what are the, the, the astronomical chances that the library has a resource for that? <laughs> like, <laughs> so again, you don't know what your system has until you look, but sometimes there are really niche things that like are exactly what you need. 
And you may have them because a lot of other people in your community had that need. And like a library system looked at that and was just like, how can we fix that? And so then you have things like an auto repair source guide where you can download like up-to-date service and repair information for like a, an utter crap ton of vehicles that are currently in use. Like, Honestly, that's a, that's a pretty big deal too. Cause I know that a lot of people, um, uh, I know a lot of people that work on their cars, but uh, as someone that's tried to find information on places like Google and YouTube, sometimes it's hard to find the specific make and model just through a Google search or through or a YouTube yes. search. And it sounds like this database is actually like carefully curated so you can easily find the vehicle you're looking for. Correct. And so a lot of that, like, again, in this case, it's a comprehensive enough one that sometimes you'll even get like step-by-step -step information on how to repair certain issues. It'll get access to diagrams to see how things are like laid out, which is, can be super important for cars because there are some things that you just can't figure out how they're laid out until you take them apart, which is not a thing most people are equipped to do. And like, even if you're just looking to be preventative about it, like it'll give you a general idea of like maintenance schedules, and like what things generally should cost, which can be super useful for marginalized folks, especially those who are like read and treated as like women or like, because, oh boy, talk about uh, an absolute ripoff. Like this tool, if you were living in this area, would give you the ability to say, look, I know what this part should cost. Don't be a dick about it this like <laughs> uh so so what i what i'm getting now is anytime that uh i i need maintenance on my car i should first check to see if my library offers this service so that i can learn about it myself and even if i don't feel comfortable uh making the repairs myself i can have a pretty good idea of what's going on so i'm less likely to get you know screwed over exactly okay and so this is the kind of thing that like I point to when people are like, well, I mean, it's just like, things will just continue to get more and more esoteric in terms of like, what do you think a library should be responsible for or make available to its patrons? And I think like one of the coolest examples of this is the one that I have lined up next. So let me go ahead and swap over. Where are you? Oh, that's where. So I'll stop sharing this and change to the new one. Yes, sure here. Cool. So next place we're going is the DC library. So waiting for that to load. So you know how like most like older members of the family will have like a bajillion like photographs and videos and like old tapes and memorabilia that like just never gets copied or protected or saved or anything of that nature. Meet the memory lab. All right. We're, we're still on the, my examples page, by the way. Oh, my bad. I'm no, not sure. That's did. okay. Hmm. Let's try. Oh, I know what it did. Okay. And so then we can do, yeah, there we go. So yeah. There uh, we go. Meet the Memory Lab at DC, which in its essence is basically a place that gives the public tools to archive their own like family histories and documents and memorabilia and whatnot. And so in this case, there is a lab where if you have like old home movies on VHS or like old video cameras or like of a graduation that happened in like 1979 or something before the advent of like YouTube or whatever. Like if you have things on a floppy disk that you need protected before like that becomes a, uh, an extinct thing, 
you can go to the memory lab in DC and book it for a three hour session, bring a box of all of that old memorabilia and walk out of there with an external hard drive or a USB or in one of your cloud storage um, apps and have all of that saved there. What? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, this is, this is important because um, I've worked in uh, like audio visual technology before and, Mm -hmm. and probably the saddest thing that happens is uh, older people coming in, hoping to, uh, by VHS players because uh, they can't find them anywhere anymore because they've just stopped making them. But they have all of these old ho- home movies and stuff that they, they want to be able to watch again. And, and they're desperately looking for places that can convert it to, to digital. But the only places we've been able to tell them about are like uh, photo shops that charge for the privilege. Exactly. And that is the sort of thing that like the memory lab at DC is directly designed to solve because it's a project that was birthed from the question of like whose memories, whose history gets to be protected. And so by instituting the memory lab and a place that is as like historically black as DC, now all of a sudden, a lot of people of color have access to being able to preserve a lot of like their family histories and records that like more often than not tend to get like left behind or not like saved or in some cases actively erased. So being able to make that, um, being able to be your own personal archivist or your family's archivist, even if you can get like all of those scattered materials and bring them in. It's just so liberating in a lot of senses. So this is probably like the most hard hitting, but also like the weirdest to explain that like you can do a lot depending on like what your particular system can, um, what resources and things it's been able to invest in. So it's always worth checking because sometimes the perfect answer for a thing, a problem you didn't even realize you had is right there and freely accessible. So yeah, that's pretty cool. So That's basically like the extent of what I wanted to, um, of what I wanted to get across. So now we move on to another, um, what's basically going to be the remainder of the presentation, which let me go ahead and pop that up. Where are you? There you are. I need and want volunteers. Um, I want to see, like, where are y'all based? Like, what cis- like what cities are y'all in? And I want to poke around and see if you can find any, like, of those weird niche services that, like, are available to you once you have your card. Because, like, I do this for fun because I know that, like, I know how to do this. But I figured that by walking through the process of like looking at a system that I'm not familiar with from scratch, that maybe y'all will have a better um, like understanding or grasp of like how to do it on like your own times and terms. So uh, that actually leads me to, to going in chat here. Uh, a few comments that have come in a lot. Uh, Jasper even pointed out that, uh, like me, he had no idea uh, that these resources were available. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Black Queen, Black Queen, uh, 127. Nice. My family has so many pictures stored all over. So uh, making use of the Memory Lab resource. Um, and I did notice uh, there was a, a, there was a uh, comment in here um uh, asking if uh, Corson was going to ask their library in Seattle if they had similar backpacks for state parks and museums. So Ooh. maybe looking at like a Seattle public library. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and poke around. So where are you? 
Okay, so Seattle, let's see if I can move the zoom bar out of the way so that way I can actually access my tabs up here. Excellent. So Seattle Public Library. It's interesting because like I know I have a few friends who live in like that region, but I have no idea like what they've got. Okay, so we've got a few sections here. Kids and families, teens, like seniors. It, if it's anywhere, it might be under either fun and games or civics and social services. Oh, oh. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yes. I see gaming. Like, I see I gaming. Mm -hmm. So fun fact, when I lived in Flint, Michigan, um, they used to have every week a game night where they would bring out like a few Nintendo Wii's and a few copies of like Smash Brothers and Mario Kart and like kids could like have a go play, like actually get access to that. This explains why you can kick my butt at it so regularly. Had a lot of practice growing up. So like a lot of this is just, uh, oh, so before I get distracted and lost in the weeds, let me actually answer the question first. So it does look like they have quite a few things. Oh, oh, that's fun. So discover passes, what are we seeing? Yep, you can check out a discover pass for two weeks with your card. It gives you free access to millions of acres of state parks and recreational areas in Washington, bingo. Now, I probably won't be able to do this because, again, I don't actually have a card here. But, yeah, if you do, place hold. <laughs> Get to that Seattle library. Go now. Oh, wait, it's uh, Sunday. They might be closed. I mean, probably. Most places tend to be. Uh, most libraries tend to be closed on Sundays. But that's not always a guarantee. Let's see. Let's see. What are your hours? Oh, no, they are, in fact, open on Sundays. So, oh. again, you don't know until you look. That's a, a lot of different. So, and it looks like, so each of these branches, because they're all part of the same, like, uh, this, overarching mm -hmm. library, they should all have access to, to these passes then. Correct. And so I know that, especially in um, Chesterfield, one of the cool features is that like, even if let's say that your home branch in Chesterfield is my branch, uh, Meadowdale, like if you come and our, we don't have the book that you're looking for, if you place a hold, a dude will go to the other library. Like we have a delivery driver basically. And every day he will go from branch to branch and pick up the books that have been reserved for use in other places and drop them off at the place. So like, even if you don't have the ability to go like 20 miles south to like the Enon Etrick branch to get that one niche DVD, you put a hold on it, a dude will have that to your home branch and like, usually a turnaround of like one to three days so yeah in a lot of cases one system will get you access to everything that's within that system this is just so cool yeah and like this is kind of like the um this is one of the eternal struggles of like working in public libraries is that you know how much cool stuff that your branches and your systems like have access to, but a lot of people don't necessarily have the time or like the thought to like sit down and like, you know, oh, let me go to my local library systems webpage and like go diving through like their resource lists. <laughs> and am I guessing that this is at least partially because like, public libraries only get so much of a budget that they they're they're too busy putting it into the services they don't really have the ability to advertise it as uh as well as like businesses that are offering these services a little bit it's so part of that can be it another part is that because libraries like librarians in particular are one of the jobs with like ridiculously high job satisfaction rates. It means that most people don't retire from those positions, which means that you see a lot of branches that are primarily staffed by like 
folks who like started working in like the 70s or the 80s or what have you, which can mean that they're not necessarily as familiar with like some of the resources that might be more relevant to like, you know, millennials or Gen Z or what have you. And so sometimes it definitely is a problem of like just not having the proper resources to like market everything. But in other cases, it can be the time lag between like the ways that a community's needs shift and like the when the library system realizes like what that shift is. Does that does that make sense? It does. Um, and <clears throat> I, I guess the thing is, is that like that that makes sense as to why uh, it takes a while for those services to get um to even appear i Correct. just uh i i feel like and the reason I, why I'm, I'm just really excited about this panel now is is that i feel like there needs to be some way for for more people to to even know that this exists like when a library th this is actually so this is something that um that I think about a lot in, in public services, you know, we've been having a lot of discussions uh, lately in the media uh, because the media is corporately controlled that uh, is our library is a bad business. Uh, <laughs> the answer is yes. yes. They're horrible businesses because that's not the point. Right. <laughs> and, and the thing is, is that is, is this kind of what I mean is that like they, they're already putting all of the resources that they, that they're getting towards this service. But, but then if people don't know that these services exist, it, it almost seems to me like libraries could use a, a, a bigger, you know, I'll say it again, a bigger PR budget. So imagine, imagine like if you're, you're watching YouTube and instead of getting a advertisement for like a local business or a local mm -hmm. political cabinet uh, candidate, you get an advertisement for your local library. Now that would be interesting. Right? Hmm. Like, like, yeah, because, because you talk about the, these services that are available that uh, millennials and, and Gen Z would, would care about. But the other thing is, is that if you've got these people working in libraries who have been there since the seventies, they might not even realize uh, the, the best ways to reach younger audiences now, because yes. for the most part, and obviously this is a gross generalization, <laughs> um, the millennials and Gen Z aren't watching television. If they're reading the newspaper, they're reading it online. They're not reading like local newspapers with local advertisements in it. A lot of them aren't listening to the radio. So even if the library would, would make announcements on these things, uh, which like uh, when I worked for WNRN in Charlottesville, we did make an, uh, regular announcements for our public systems. But if I, as, as a millennial or, or a, a Gen Z person, isn't listening to the radio, they're not hearing these announcements. Mm, that's true and like that's kind of the um the the bridge that's trying to be um like kind of sealed up right now is because there has been like a pretty big push within the library field regarding like questions of uh, diversity and equity and inclusion and like a lot of those tend to have like a um a lot of people will make the mistake of thinking that that's only one category or another, like, oh, it's just like the gay agenda, or oh, it's just like a Black people thing. But like, also age diversity is something that's like really, really important when you're thinking about like library services, because there's this weird sort of uh, co like kind of contradiction that lies at the heart of it, right? Because a lot of libraries knew from a long time ago, like early 2000s, 90s, like that things were going to become digital. And so in that way, a lot of them started making those preparations early, which is why now in 2021, even like smaller libraries, like the one that I showed y'all that had like the auto repair guide in like Pennsylvania, have access to a lot of like digital resources and databases and things that their patrons can access. But on the flip side, they were essentially good on the modern front, realizing that things were going to be digital. But the piece that is missing in a lot of cases is how to make sure that the people they serve 
are aware of the full extent of like the resources that they've been amassing for use. So yeah, there's definitely a bit of tension there and I'm seeing signs that like we might be able to see um, <clears throat> things like, I have full confidence that the field of libraries is going to look very different within the next 10 years or so, because like things just continue to accelerate and a lot of libraries make it their business to keep up with those accelerations. And they're not always successful because, you know, we're people, but like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm thinking of one incident in particular where there was a library that had a very short-lived program where you could rent out 3D glasses. To take <laughs> and it became very clear that that wasn't a format that was going to last. But like, that is the level of like preparation and thought that like a lot of the better library systems will try to have. So, yeah. That's... That's so fascinating to me. No, there is a, I would personally be willing to bet that like libraries have tried and like discarded more services than most people realize that ever realize that they have. <laughs> yeah. So, but a lot of that also is dependent on patron input. Like, what people actually give feedback about with libraries is I cannot stress to you how important that is because libraries tend to be very user and patron directed places. Like it is quite literally their job to provide access to the things that like their community is supposed to need. So having an idea of what people want or need out of their library system can go a long way, which is why a lot of like friends of library organizations, like which are basically like auxiliary um, groups that try to do like fundraising and things specifically to help keep libraries up and running. Um, a lot of those tend to be staffed by like older, um, like older, like senior citizens, because like they are very intimately aware that like their input can be, can do a lot to shape the direction that a library goes in. So if there are things that like you would like to see your, your local branch get access to, it's definitely worth like sending an email or trying to like talk to like your local branch manager or like talking to a local librarian and being like, hey, is this a thing that y'all have access to? But like another thing that I do want to strongly recommend is that just because you don't ac have access to something through your library system doesn't necessarily mean that you can't kind of double dip in the sense that we have friends. And like, as long as your friends also have cards at the places they're at, like, there is no rule saying that like, you can't like check out a Virginia State Park Pass from like Chesterfield County and like be into your friend who lives in like Petersburg or whatever and being like, hey, wanna go to Shenandoah? Like, you have the ability to kind of like, I don't want to make a, a trading card game comparison because it doesn't fully work, but it's a similar thought process is just knowing that like, hey, I have access to this database, this database, and this database. What do you have access to? And figuring out where the gaps are, talking to each other, coordinating, like. Oh no, that's amazing. Library cards, swap them, collect them, trade them with your friends. I mean, I will, I will warn you, though, a lot of libraries, for, for darn good reason, will not check out to you if they know that you are using a card that's not yours. Right. Like, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. But there is, like, on occasion, like, I'll have, um, like, one of my friends or a partner or, like, a, a research acquaintance, and they'll be like, hey, there's a book that I've been trying to get a hold of that, like, VCU has, but, like, my place doesn't. 
do you have access to that still? And I'll be like, yeah, is there like a specific chapter you need? I'll scan that, send it over and like, wait, there was a thing I was looking for a while ago that we see you didn't have and so on and so forth. Yeah. So yeah, that's free use. Well, and, and that's neat because that's like, that's another thing that uh, we're talking about, you know, how there are businesses that provide these services, but, but you compare that to something like, uh, Disney plus, which comes up with, yeah, you can have four different accounts on there, but then they get all whiny and crazy when you're, you're not, uh, when, when people are sharing those accounts and for the library, it's like, no, we we're the whole point is to serve the community. Let's serve it. Correct. So like, that is the thing is that like libraries more than a lot of other institutions are very on the hook to like their the communities that they're in because like they pay attention to how many times things get checked out like a lot of the branches now are smart enough to be like how many times the computers get logged into how many resumes do we print for people on a yearly basis like how many people come here like looking for um access to genealogy information like do I still have that actually? That's just kind of another one of those uh, wild things. Research, databases, books, reading, health. Yeah, no, we definitely still have the Ancestry membership. <laughs> you mean I don't have to pay Ancestry.com? I just have to see if my mm -hmm. local library has this? I am going to, this, this stream is going to get blacklisted by so many businesses. <laughs> they're, they're, they're coming for me. So sort of, but a lot of the reason that this works is because it's not necessarily that it's free. It's that the library uses like the financial resources that they get to invest in access to things like this. Right. Like. There's a reason that this is a program that's known as Ancestry Library, because like part of the licensing agreement, I think, is that you can only access it while you are physically inside the library. Right. That's where the login information is, um, is done. So, oh, I remember what I was doing here. Programs. Adults. Oh, what adult programs are in Chesterfield in the Charlottesville area? Oh, did you know there's a grand opening of a library near you tomorrow from 9 a.m. <laughs> to 10 a.m.? I actually, so I, I was going to ask you because I used to live in Charlottesville and I don't anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in a smaller town now, uh, so I want to I wanted to see uh, what's available in Waynesboro because yeah. we've been looking at mostly big cities. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me to see what uh, is available in like smaller areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so looks like, how do I, oh, neat. Hey, do you need a document you have notarized? Did you <laughs> want to tax forms? Did you want I to should... display your art in a public place? Like, Hey, did you check out, we just had the painting with Cha Cha event in PJ Con a couple nights ago. Oh, I need to go back and watch that. Yeah, uh... so, so Cha Cha <laughs> has been painting pictures with his tongue. So uh, amazing. Yeah, so uh I I I might just try to get those displayed actually. Oh, so hey, looks like Waynesboro also has access to Ancestry mm. Library and Heritage Quest and Fold Tree, which if you know you have family members that are in the military and I do family. actually, yeah. And the Internet Archive. Like yeah. So that's a thing that you have access to. What else do we have? Genealogy e-library. What do we got here? Yeah, there we go. Libby, Libby. in our overdrive. Yep. So if you like wanted to access anything that's on those, get mm -hmm. your library card, download Libby, listen to a podcast or an audio book on your way to work. Actually, that's a pretty big deal because uh, Jasper is a huge podcast fan. So. <laughs> Yes. So I've been reading a lot of my books through uh, audiobook format recently because I just haven't had like the time to sit down and like pick up a book, which is ironic given where I work. <laughs> but I do still have the ability to grab like an audiobook off the shelf, check it off to myself. And that's how I got through We Were Eight Years in Power by Ta-Nehisi Coates. 
put in the fucking CDs and listen to it on my way to and from work for like a month. Like, I love these places. I love them so much because the bare, like the basic principle that they are built on that they don't necessarily always succeed at, but they do always try is providing access to as much information to as many people in their community as is possible. And so a lot of the work of libraries is just finding more, more fully realized versions of that vision. Bishop, this has been an incredibly informative panel, and I, I really want to thank you for being a part of this. Yeah, I was glad to, to be on. Like, I will rant about this basically to anybody who will listen because it's important that these things get used. <laughs> well, uh, the next time, you know, this is something that I could even uh, do again sometime just on the stream. Uh, just oh, go through some more like libraries. Yeah, like, because yeah. th this is definitely something that I think more people need to know about and they need more access to. So. I'm definitely willing uh, to, to try to facilitate that. Was there anything else uh, that you wanted to, to say in the time that we have allotted? If you do not have your card, <laughs> go get one. Either today if you're open on Sunday or tomorrow if you have the time or on Saturday if you are working a standard Monday through Friday. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm off for the next two days, so I think I have to go get my library card Monday or Tuesday. Like, it's just going to have you to do. happen. Because that is the key to unlocking a lot of gates, some of which you didn't even realize were there. Well, thank you very much, Bishop. Uh, for those of you uh, tuning in right now, we still have plenty of PJCon left. Coming up at 6 p.m., actually, Bishop's going to be back along with uh, Soraya, Fiona, and uh, me. Uh, Arcadia Rodriguez-Ruiz is going to be interviewing the three of us on the differences between allies and bystanders mm -hmm. in, uh, in your social scene, uh, which I think is going to be probably one yeah. of the heaviest, but also just most important panels that we we have this con yeah i'm looking forward to it and then closing so that's at 6 p.m eastern today uh closing ceremonies will be at 9 p.m eastern jasper and i are going to go over the con and i highly recommend everybody that has watched or been a part of it in some way to join in for that because we're just going to debrief the whole thing figure out what worked what maybe we need to change if we ever decide to do this again should we do this again that yes. sort of thing yeah there we go and then um and then uh, we're going to end it with Subculture Shock tonight at 10. Sounds Bishop, good. Bishop, thank you very much uh, for joining us. And uh, everybody, I guess it's time to go get our library cards. Yes, it is. Yeah. I'll see you all later today.